We are still doing uh, the consecrated disciple with the subtopic a healthy growth cycle. Now we, we were looking at manhood the last time we spoke, which we said was the stage of maturity after having looked at babyhood childhood and now we are in manhood our foundational scripture was 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14 it reads as follows but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander of his people. Before you have, before, because you have not kept to what the Lord commanded you. Amen. So we looked here um, at the definition of the term man. <laughs> Understanding that God, when God was speaking, he was not speaking about a fully grown man. <coughs> but he was actually speaking of a teenager. And he called him a man because of the state of his heart. Now, if we look at that term, man, we all agree that David was a man, right? But he was not a husband at the time. He certainly was a servant. And we established that he was a champion. Now it would be unbecoming of us if we were to look at discipleship and just fly through servanthood. Because that is the foundation of discipleship. So we're going to be looking at servanthood today. But before we get there, we're going to take a little detour. Now, let us look at diet. Now, our diet affects our maturity. The level of growth of a person is directly linked to the type of food they eat. Food plays an important role in any organism. So the, uh, the, the absence thereof will ultimately lead to death. Now, scientists say that a human body can last about two months without food. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what the cut-off uh, period is for the spirit. If it's two months for the body, how long is it for the spirit? Now, an unbalanced diet <coughs> or lacking proper nutrition may stunt growth in height and cause various diseases like diabetes and cancer. Now, physically, 
It is what you eat that will affect your body. But for your spirit and your soul, it is what you look at and what you listen to. If we look at the body, if you lack, for instance, in vitamin D or calcium, that could lead to osteoporosis. 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 Which is fragile bones. If you abuse alcohol that could lead to liver cirrhosis so that means your, your liver will be scarred or permanently damaged so whatever you take in affects your body in some way. So also what you watch and what you listen to, it affects your, your soul and your spirit. Have you ever watched a romantic drama? And then decided you want to get married so badly. Or you start getting depressed about why you're single. It's a problem that you did not have. But once you watch it, then you realize that there's something that, that is missing. So we, be, we need to be careful of what we watch. Because with, even with lust, watching things that are unkosher on television will bear influence to what you desire and what you listen to. Have you ever found yourself having a problem with somebody who's never done anything to you. Only because you heard somebody else say something bad about them. Have you ever been the third person in, a, in an argument? And when the people make up, you're the only one left with a problem. That's because you heard something and it affected affected how you see the person and you get stuck there when life moves on so when people come and tell you things it's important for you to weigh if you know yourself that you don't even need to hear the second part of the story then don't even listen to the first part amen Amen. Now, if unhealthy eating is not corrected at childhood stage, this results in poor brain development, weak learning, low immunity, Increased infections and in many cases death. Now, when we look at immunity, you'll see that during the flu season, people always rush uh, to get vitamin C supplements. Because every nutrient strengthens the body in some way. Immunity is the system in the body that is able to recognize and tolerate things that are of the body. And they also recognize 
and reject something that is foreign to the body. Ziyakwazi futhi ukuthi zibone into engawulungele umzimba bese ziyayikhahlela noma ziyithi. I know somebody is already saying that's discernment. Ngiyazo uthi zusethi lokho kuhlolisisisa. Because when we say to recognize, ngoba uma ngabe sikhuluma ukuthi ayabona qaphele. We mean they are discerning. Sisho ukuthi ke bayahlolisisa. So they are able to discern what is good for the body. Bayakwazi ukubona ukuthi yini elungele umzimba and what is not. Just like we need to work with our discernment. So the, Im, the immune system of the body carries the discernment of the body. And they need us to eat a certain way in order for them to be strengthened. Now in order for us to be able to discern in the house of the Lord, it's not about saying I don't feel that person or I don't like that person but our discernment rests on what we eat which is the word of God not hearing from other people but feeding off of the word of God because that's what helps us to test spirits. Now if we look at importance of maturity now maturity shows that the spiritual food we are receiving is effective for our growth. It attests to the transforming power of the word of God. The word of God is certified by God. He has confidence in it. So much so that he has placed it above his name. Meaning that if you actually use the word of God, you are certainly going to see results. Maybe let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, the word profitable there, it means it's beneficial. It means it's of service. It's rewarding. It's productive. It is helpful in achieving those things. So if we are sincerely reading the word of God, it should be able to produce those things in us. Now there is a, a show that... Uh, we used to watch at home back in the day called My 600 Pound Life. My 600 Life Pound. <laughs> My 600 Pound Life. Yes. And there you'd see people who are overweight, some to the point of being immobile. And then there'd have to be an intervention by a, a bariatric surgeon. Now, he would then intervene in the sense of trying to help them lose weight. Now, the first thing he would do is that he would check their commitment. How he would do that is is that he would challenge them to lose about 50 pounds before he approves them for surgery to reduce their stomach. Because if they, they were to 
decrease the size and still not lose the weight or change the diet, the stomach would still stretch and would be pointless. So what he would do is he would give them a specific diet meaning he knew how many calories they were supposed to eat per day. And he knew that they would lose about 50 pounds per month. Which was about 22 kilograms. And so uh, they would go back home and they were supposed to practice using this diet that he has given them. And they would have to come in uh, after a month and jump on the scale. Now the scale doesn't lie. They would jump on the scale. Some would have lost weight. Some would have not lost weight. And they would say to the doctor, I did eat as you said. I changed my diet. But I'm just not losing weight. It's just how my body works. Now the doctor knows this diet. It has been tried and tested. And it has worked for many people. Now then comes this one person who's an anomaly and it just doesn't work. And the doctor would know that he's being played because he knows what results should come out from the diet. So no excuse suffices for them not losing weight. Then here we come to God. Him knowing that the diet that he has given us is tried and tested and he knows for a fact that it's going to work. Then we come and we say, it's just not working. I'm just struggling. This is different from the other people. When he knows exactly that his word works. I don't know, you be the judge here. Who's at the wrong? Is it us or God? Has the word stopped working? So why have we not changed? What's happening? Because the word is being released. Every Sunday, every Monday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, and Friday, sometimes even Saturday. So are we making God out to be a liar? Because we are still gossiping. We're still lying. We're still complaining. We're still doing all these things that if the word were present in us, we shouldn't be doing. The fact that we are not growing, it must mean we're not eating. We are not reading the word. We are not feasting off of the word. We are eating the food for the body, but our spirits are deprived. And they cannot lead because they are frail. Amen. Amen. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit is made known through maturity. Uh, which comes from the ability to listen and obey. There's hearing, there's listening, and there's obeying. Everybody can hear me in this room. But not everybody is listening. Because hearing can be hearing any sound that is, uh, that, that is uh, made. But listening is when you actually focus in order to hear and understand what is being said. Then you carry it out 
which is obedience. Now Holy Spirit is present with us. And if I know one thing about Holy Spirit is that he speaks. He will tell you when not to speak. He will tell you when to leave people. He will even tell you what to dress. Amen. Amen. He certainly does speak. But are we listening? He once taught me one very interesting thing. While I was working, I was answering a phone and the person on the line was speaking. When I answered the phone, I had been a part of a conversation that was happening in the office. Now the conversation was quite interesting. And when when the phone rang, they didn't stop talking, but I had to answer the phone. And when I answered, I still wanted to listen there. I heard the person speaking on the phone. I just didn't hear what they were saying because I was not intentionally listening to them. I was more interested in the conversation. And Holy Spirit said, this is exactly what you do to me. Where I'll be talking to you, but you're more interested in the people around you than in actually listening to me. Now, our maturity will only come about if we are able to move away from all this that is happening and be able to actually focus on the person on the phone because he is here to bring life. These are probably speaking gossip but Holy Spirit is here to bring life. Amen. Amen. Now maturity allows for room to be made for new babies. In every stage that we are we are in, we are meant to learn master the skill and graduate just like in school are we still in grade one we're not because we learned we mastered and we graduated. If you didn't master it, you were failed and you repeated the grade. The same is true spiritually. We go through a stage, we learn something, we master it, and we graduate. And we get mature. But many of us are not maturing. Everybody still wants to run to the pastor and tell him they have a problem. Now if we look at the ratio of the pastors to the congregation and we we have all the old members not growing and wanting to run to the pastor every time they have trouble. When will the young, the babies come? When will they get attention? If people are not graduating, when a person is in hospital, they get sick and they are treated and they have to get better. In most cases, with some people, when they don't get better, they are taken to alternative care so that there is room for other people. In fact, we will know when there was a COVID that they told you that if you could manage your symptoms Treat them at home. Let the, the hospital beds before emergency cases. 
Jesus. Could we do the same at church? And allow the, the church beds to be for emergency cases. Because people will die not having access because people don't want to be weaned. So are we going to move away from saying when we say the pastor does not pay attention to me. Nobody cares about me. Amen. Amen. I'm worried. Now let us actually look at the qualities of maturity. So that we can check ourselves. Just like we did the last time. Where we were weighing uh, a childlike person. And a childish person. And we got to see where we were standing. With the thing that we were doing. Whether we were being childish or we were being childlike. We said childish, childish bad and childlike good. Now we are looking at the qualities of maturity. There are many characteristics of manhood or maturity that we could discuss, but we'll discuss three of these. We'll be looking at seeking first the kingdom. We'll look at servanthood and the ability to recognize God at work. Now looking at seeking first the kingdom of God, I know most of us are already thinking of Matthew 6.33. But maybe let's look at it from uh, Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, I like it more uh, from the Amplified Classic, so I'll read uh, the Amplified Classic. I'll just read verse 1 of it. It says, Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the council of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. That is a mouthful. That is self-explanatory. Forsaking things, may, may, uh, for th forsaking things that seem enjoyable but are deadly leads to a blessing of God. It may not always lead to favor with man. Though. So whenever you move away from that, you are definitely moving into favor with God. But usually people don't like you. They'd probably say you're boring or you're self-righteous, most holier than thou, who's uptight. Now submitting yourselves to the ways and advice of the ungodly people is deadly. 
The Bible itself tells us that bad company corrupts good character. We always have these excuses. I'm trying to change them. I want them to see that, that, that God has power to change people. And you go and you sit with them. And you end up being the one who compromises. You end up being the one who falls prey to their deeds. Amen. Amen. It is our responsibility to evaluate everything in our lives and then prioritize according to importance. This means we have to know the value of people and things in our lives. So you need to know who brings value and who's dead weight. You need to know who brings harm and who builds you. Because we have so many people in our lives that are just sitting there. But it's important every now and then to do some stock taking and see what you're discarding. Because you end up falling prey to sin. Because of the people that you don't need in your life. But you're just keeping. It's not a shame to let go of people. Relationships do end. Communications do get cut. But there are people who will insist on keeping contact with their grade one friends. And they are no longer building them in any way. I remember one time, God told me to clear up my phone book. And I thought that was terribly harsh. I'm already introverted. Which means it's already hard to make friends. So if I throw out the ones I already have, then I'm left alone. I did half of what he said. And I left some. And they left me in a ditch. Because when God speaks, He's not doing it just to, to hurt you. He's not doing it just for the sake of doing it. It's not to torture you. But it's because he knows what's best for you. So when he says let go of people, when he says move away from them, in fact in most cases that's when they become more attached to you. But when he says let go, then you ought to let go. Because if you were re to really look at, the, at what they bring to your life, you realize they don't bring anything, but they're only here to take. You see, in our relationships, when we enter into relationships, rather, we shouldn't enter into them because I need somebody who's going to do this. I need somebody who's going to do this. But you need to enter into a relationship because you say, I have so much time. Time and, and love, love and, patience and patience that I want to give it to somebody else. People get married because they want somebody who's going to wash their clothes. Somebody's going to open the door. Somebody's going to hold my hand. He's coming and saying, I need somebody who's going to wash my clothes and cook for me and, 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 and clean the house. And she's saying, I want somebody who's going to take care of me who's going to wash the cars and change the tires and do all these things that I need so now you both come into the marriage you both need something who's going to give because we both came in expecting so when we enter into relationships we 
need to enter because we want to make a change in somebody's life. Amen. Amen. So it is our responsibility to evaluate everything in our lives and then prioritize according to importance. Unhealthy things and ungodly things are usually enjoyable. But the problem is they are only enjoyable to the taste. But their end is dire. Now, I love junk food. If I could change laws, I would say let our staple be junk food. But now I cannot eat junk food all the time. Because it's unhealthy. In as much as it's something I like. But I cannot live on it. Because it does not give life. Now, when we were saved, it wasn't because we were done sinning. It wasn't because we hated sin. In fact, we still love it now. Given an opportunity, we still go back and do it. But because we know it's not good for us, we know it leads to death. We're going to eat the healthy food. I don't like greens. Green vegetables. Vegetables are just horrible. I do not understand them. But whether I understand them or not, my body still needs them. You may not love reading the word. In fact, you may not love reading the Old Testament. Half the things you don't understand. Especially when you go to read the prophets. You read some chapters in Isaiah. And you think, who even are they talking about? But all of that you need. Because everything has a purpose. So just because it's not nice, doesn't mean you don't need it. Or you don't have to have it. Amen. We do not go to church because it's nice. Everybody, Everybody loves us and it's perfect. We go because we love God. And we want to worship Him. Even if half the house hates you, you got to walk in like you don't care. Because you're not here for people. You're here for God. Now we have a problem problem of people who don't come to church because five people don't like him. Who attends church because it's nice? Who went to school because it was nice? I didn't like school. I'm not a morning person. I hated group work too. But I had to go. I had to do all those things. When we have to go to hospital, we don't go because it's nice. We go because we need to go there. We come to church not because it's nice. The worship team sings beautifully. Oh, they preach this beautiful word. The pastors are so nice. The ashes treat us good. No. No. Huh? Maybe the usher that you're going to meet at the door is the very one that you just had an argument with. And, you, and they're standing at the door. Are you going to turn and go back home? Because you understand who you're here for. You're going to come into church. Isn't it? So why are we so fussy? Seeking is an action that we have to take. It means we have to inquire into the kingdom. We have to have a desire. Now, when we were kids, we used to play hide and seek. Now, the person who was seeking 
didn't seek by sitting down. But they had to go around searching places. Have you ever searched for your phone sitting down? That mini heart attack that you have when you can't find the phone makes you get up and search wherever you have to. For a person who has who has had their car stolen, they will know that you even search in ridiculous places. When my father had his car stolen, he even searched for it under other cars. Because when you're seeking, you're desperate. So why do we seek watching the television? Why do we seek when we're just sitting here at church on Sunday? Which kingdom are we seeking? Now, being a part of the training department means I have to do a lot of research. I don't know about you, but when I do research, I don't do it by sitting in front of the computer and telling it to give me everything I need. But I have to actively type something into the computer. If I sit and look at it, it's going to look at me too. Sometimes I will have to go to people who have better knowledge of a subject in order to understand it. If I need to understand anything about medicine, I go to a doctor. If I need anything about archaeology, I'll go to an archaeologist. But I will actively do something in order to attain what I need. So when we say we are seeking the kingdom of God, you're not going to seek the kingdom of God waiting for Sunday service or waiting for Bible study. But you're going to bother people. How do I study the Bible? How do I know about a certain topic? Don't wait for somebody to teach you. Remember, you have to graduate. You have to get out of that bed. Because somebody else needs it. Somebody will come and say, I want to know something about worship. I must call the apostle and just and, and, and ask them to give me everything that talks about, about worship. Instead of rather saying, this is what I found, is it proper for me to use this material? We are at a place where we love being spoon-fed. But you cannot spoon-feed a person the kingdom. You see, the responsibility of a person who stands here is to tell you what God says. They cannot make you do it. It's your decision. So if you are seeking the kingdom of God, you will go beyond the listening to what is said here and carry it out. Now, let us look at... Um, let us look at Hebrews I guess begging out there, my chapter verse uh, chapter eleven verse twenty four. Isashua eleven verse twenty four to twenty six. We have twenty six. It reads as follows. By faith Moses, when he was when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. For reason, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Amen. 
Now, I'd like for us to actually think about what Moses refused. He saw a difference in the people of God and the people in the world. There's something about the people of God that makes them peculiar. There has to be this something that makes people in other countries where they are persecuted to actually still receive Christ. Now if we look at Moses, in the world he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was a prince in Egypt. He had honor. He had wealth. Prestige. He had the things the earth and the world had to offer. Now, if we were to understand the title, uh, Pharaoh's, uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, if we were to look at uh, Egyptian mythology, starting from Isis and Osiris, these were siblings who got married while they were in rulership of, of Egypt and they bore uh, the son and he was going to be the next ruler. Then what happened in Egypt was that they adopted the system. The incestuous practice. In order to preserve the royal blood. This means that the, the, the Pharaoh would marry his sister in order to produce the next heir. So the heir was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So this is a practice that continued. So now here's God. He raises Moses while Moses is born in a time when the, the Israelites are being killed, the children of the Israelites are being killed. And he gives Moses' mother the wisdom to put him in a basket and put him in the river. Because he knows that the king maker will be going to bathe in the river. So when Moses is received and taken by Pharaoh, Daughter, he automatically gets the status of being a prince, meaning he could have been the heir apparent because he carried the title of the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Which is what the heir apparent was called. Imagine the havoc it must have caused for the Egyptians. That a Hebrew might be in line to rule Egypt. Not that it was even something that's new. Because we had had Joseph already being prime minister and being called by my favorite name Zephneth Paneer. Paneer. He was a Hebrew who actually got to rule. So Egyptians who knew the history must have already been worried because they knew it's possible for a Hebrew to be in rulership. But Moses not being caught up in the things of the world left the position of being a crown prince 
And he chose rather to suffer with the children of God. Why is it so hard for us to live not even riches? We're not even living mansions. But we fail to focus on God. We fail to leave the world and seek the things of God. Yet Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Even being heir to the treasures in Egypt. But he esteemed uh, the reproaches. All these things that you are attached to, what are they adding to your life? How are they contributing to eternal life? The wealth that you're gathering, is it going to buy you a ticket? I know I was once in a mainline church where uh, we used to pay for a ticket. Well, I didn't. I was still young. And I never understood what the ticket was. But apparently the ticket was your access card. To get to heaven. Now you knowing the truth. Why, are you, why is it so hard to forsake the things of the world? Because you are not required to save up for a ticket. Egyptian pharaohs, when they died, they were buried with prized goods. They're gone. Now archaeologists are now digging those things up. And we're selling them to each other. So they didn't take them with. They left them for us. So all those things that you are saving up, if you are hoping to take them with you, I'm sorry, but I've got bad news. They're remaining behind. All the wealthy people in earth, some of them have been now into cryogenics where they said freeze us freeze our bodies then maybe when you, you find another place where we will be able to live when earth is destroyed revive us now we know that's not going to happen because life comes from God and if you're dead you're dead you no longer have a share in this earth so your money does not afford you life when it's gone it's gone so you cannot put earthly things above spiritual things and grow spiritually there's a common saying that I always hear where people will say, hey, so and so, ever since they left the church, they just started prospering. They have A, B, C, and D. They bought a car. What is prospering? What does it mean to prosper? Is it having a big house? Is it having a fancy car? Or is it serving the Lord's purpose? Samuel had all the money. Uh, Sam, uh, Solomon had all the money. 
And he's the one who comes and tells us. I'm sorry to tell you guys. But all is vanity. He got to experience all the pleasures. He could buy whatever he wanted. But he tells us. Don't even bother. You're wasting your time. Amen. Amen. Now, there is no such thing as balancing the spiritual and the worldly. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You cannot serve two masters. Now, another person may think, oh, well, that means you're not supposed to be rich. But God is not against wealth. Abraham was wealthy. According to Genesis 13 verse 2, the Bible certainly tells us he was wealthy. Please read it. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2 from the Amplified Classic Version. We can move back to the New King James. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And Isaac was also very rich, no, uh, according no, to Genesis 26, verse 12. No, 13. Isaac, verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Now God is not against us having good things. Just because we're speaking of seeking the kingdom, it doesn't mean now we have to walk in poverty. It's just that some are more interested in making money than in serving God. But spiritual things have to come first if you are to be spiritual. Now, if we look at Galatians 5, uh, verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do things that you wish. So we see here that it's either or. So it cannot be world and God. You are either for God or for the devil. So some people usually say, I'll come to God when I'm done. Remember what we said. We were all not done. If sin was legalized by God, we'd probably be the first to run and go and do every sin. But we have to choose which is beneficial for us. So you choose the world or you choose God. Remember we said it's not a sin to have money. It's wrong for money to have you. So when you start feeling the need to start bribing in order to get more money, then there's an issue. Suffering does not necessarily mean being poor. As many have come to believe. Christ suffered, but he certainly wasn't poor. He wore a seamless tunic. Now, seamless weaving took more time, which meant it was costly. He was also supported by wealthy people. Maybe let's look at uh, Luke 8 uh, from uh, verse 1 to 3 in the NLT. Soon after Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God, 
he took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who, may, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contrib contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So he certainly wasn't in lack. He had wealthy people supporting him. So suffering was not him being poor. He experienced the finer things in life. He was anointed with expensive oil. And remember the gifts he got when he was a kid, a child. He received gifts from wise men, which were not three. But the wise men carried three types of gifts. And they carried them in cartloads. And they sustained him. So if you think suffering is equivalent to poverty, you're mistaken. You're depriving yourself of the finer things in life. Amen. Amen. Now we're moving on to servanthood. Luke 17, verse 7 to 10. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he was to, excuse me, and which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in, in from the field, come at once and sit to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper? And gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he think that servant, does he, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Excuse me. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Amen. Why are we always wanting praise? Why are we always wanting recognition? People must know what we do. People must know the contribution that we make. It must be announced. When the Bible clearly tells us, forget about a thank you. Now in the department I work in, in the department that I work in, I get exhausted because the people that I work with like saying thank you. They will give you a whole speech just to say thank you. And it's exhausting because I'm merely doing my job. And I like being thanked by God. So please don't deprive me. I prefer God's thank you than yours. Please don't celebrate me. <laughs> if senior says the presentation that was done here was done by, by Pastor Tellez, don't even come to me. Don't even look my way. I'd rather God say something than you. Yours is temporary. Tell it to God. Amen. Amen. Now, <laughs> now, a servant is a, is a devoted and helpful follower or supporter. In fact, there is a, a word or a term that we love most. A minister. 
I'm a minister in the house of the Lord. That's just a fancy way of saying servant. So you ought not think highly of yourself because you're a servant. Remember, the higher you go in titles, the more expectation there is for you to serve. Let's look at some servants in the Bible. Moses and Joshua. Now, uh, Joshua was called the assistant or servant of Moses. He obeyed and served Moses for at least 40 years. So all of those years, he was barely recognized. He was under somebody's uh, uh, shadow. He was, he was at some point sent by Moses Nga, under his covering to carry out an instruction which was to fight uh, the Amalekites. He wouldn't have won if he was not under the covering of Moses. Because every time Moses was weary, Every time Moses was wary, Joshua would be defeated. So he needed to be submitted under Moses in order to gain victory. So it's important, even if you have the ability, to be submitted. Ability does not mean now you have the, the license to go and do. But it means be covered. He carried out every instruction that Moses gave him to the point of Moses' death and he was able to carry on where his master left off. Now according to uh, Numbers 27, 15 to 19, We'll, we'll see that even though he was serving Moses, when there came a time for uh, Moses to, to, to pray for a leader, he doesn't say, I pray for Joshua now, make him the leader that's coming after me. But he prays different. Numbers 27, verse 15. Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like the sheep, the sheep which have not no shepherd. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Set him before Eliezer, the priest, and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. Joshua did not choose his position. He was chosen by God for the position. Serving somebody doesn't mean you're next in line. We have many people who end up being bitter because somebody was chosen over them. That begs you to go and check your motives. If you are offended by somebody else being chosen over you. Being a servant is the best place you could ever be. Because when you have to be a leader, it's rough. It's tough. Remember, we said it's not prime real estate. But it's, it's the front line of a battlefield. But if you are serving somebody, you are behind them. Amen. Amen. Then we also have Elijah and Elisha. Elisha served 
Elijah faithfully. Such that when he asked for a double portion of his anointing, God saw it fitting to give it to him. If you were to ask for a double portion of the senior apostle, are you going to be getting it? Are we going to receive it? The whole anointing. <laughs> Then there's Elisha and Gehazi. Gehazi didn't share the heart of his master. He was an opportunist who was ready to sacrifice the integrity of his leader. He couldn't see past serving the men of God. And he even lost love and respect for people. Uh, we have the Shunammite woman who's distressed and she goes to uh, Elisha when she goes to the man of God to grab hold of him Gehazi not perceiving the situation is quick to push away a person in need now Elisha was the gift of God to the nation but Gehazi became the barrier to the gift. She was blocking the person who is in need of this gift. Now, we see another case. Now, after the, the, the Shunammite woman has stated her case to Elisha, he gives uh, Gehazi an instruction. Uh, to run with the staff in order to raise the, the child of the Shunammite woman. He gives him instruction of what he should do. Now, looking at the fact that he was not able to, 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 to obey his master or respect the wishes of his master when it came to Naaman, how sure are we that he kept all the instructions that were given when he was going to raise the child. One thing we do know, the child was not raised. One of the instructions that was given to him was, don't speak to anybody. It sounds familiar, right? When we're in intercession, and the apostle is praying with us, and he says, don't speak to anybody. Go straight into the sanctuary and carry on praying. He gives us a staff there, and he says, speak to nobody, and go and carry out the task. But I find somebody that I'm going to hold, and we talk, and we greet everybody, because the instruction seems meaningless to us. But the man of God has spoken the word. Our disobedience, therefore, will then lead to us not being successful in what we are supposed to carry out. We'll end up saying, oh, there's so much oppression. Oh, we can't even worship. There's this barrier. But it's just simple disobedience. We were not able to carry out 
about that which we were told. Evidence of our disobedience will seen by the child not being resurrected. Now after all of this, we find Gehazi missing on this precious gift. He instead gets a curse because he did not carry his master's heart. Whose heart are you carrying? Do you walk out of this room with a cursing or a blessing? Are you Elisha to Elijah or are you Gehazi to Elisha? Then the next servants that we look at are Jesus and the disciples. Now, we're not going to sugarcoat this. The disciples were terribly flawed. And they were very slow. It required a lot of patience from Jesus. But in them being flawed, they were teachable. I remember an instance where Peter asked the Lord. He says, how often must I forgive my brother if he sins against me? I can imagine he was troubled. But his heart wanted to please the master. We know he was the most outspoken one. I always imagine him travel with me. Indulge me. I imagine him on the boat when uh, they're traveling across uh, the sea and Jesus shows up on the water and Peter is saying, Lord, if it's you, and everybody's thinking hey, there he goes again because he just couldn't stop himself always running forward and he jumps out of the boat and they say ha he's doing it and then they all amazed he's actually walking then he starts sinking what was he thinking what was he actually Thinking. We are pap, we are born as dead so forward. He can see all of us what here. On the boat. Who has his seen walking on water? I can imagine all these things getting to Peter's ears. Him and the, the Transfiguration Mountain. And he's being impulsive. And he's like, Lord, shouldn't we build three tabernacles here? I can imagine the other two. Saying, hey, he just can't stop talking. That was unnecessary. Like we're not part of the conversation. But he had to jump in. Not to mention when he denies Jesus. After having spoken so much, him, he's the one who denies Jesus. But he's still teachable. He still comes to Jesus. And he says, if somebody sins against me, how, many, how often must I forgive him? Because he wanted to live right. As flawed as he was. Now we have this thing of liking certain people or preferring certain people and being offended by certain people because of their personalities. Now, I'm a soft-spoken introvert. There are certain things I could just never do. I could be sitting there and seeing somebody about to fall. The best I can do is calculate the velocity at which they're going to fall and the impact they're going to have when they hit the ground. But if they expect me to run and catch them, I'm thinking about the force. I'm calculating my strength. 
And I realized, nah, 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 nah. nah. Okay, okay. But you're gonna have mum dab. But you have mum dab. Who's gonna see the same thing? Also, bunch of funai. And she's gonna run. A kitchen. And catch whoever is about to fall. Amuka ge lose to she wow. Now another person will sit there and say, Omo yimun danga sala kati. Nango abu mum dab. Then she goes. But she just saved somebody. Oh, to sing the sorties. I was calculating. Mina bengbala. You were sitting there waiting to see what's gonna happen. When you wish la pole in the rutu bogo ubano tixo wenza gala. She was the only one who acted. So as different as we are, with the different things that we do, we all need each other. The puzzle is full when we are all supposed when we are all doing what we're supposed to be doing. Another thing that the disciples were was trusting. They left their livelihood for this man. Was trusting. They left their livelihood for this man. I don't know about you. I was working a lousy job. And when God called me into full-time ministry, I didn't have a job. I held on to that thing with both my hands and my feet. I held on to that both my hands and my feet. I wasn't even getting paid good money. In fact, I was being exploited. Maybe in order to give you a picture, I was a lecturer teaching seven modules and I was getting paid $3,950. And I was not registered as an employee. So there are no records of me anywhere having ever worked. But when God called me into full-time ministry, I thought you better kick me, you better drag me kicking and screaming. And he did. And he did. I actually lost my speech for seven days until I said, yes, Lord, I'm going to quit. Because he said, if you don't quit, I'm going to break your legs. Now I thought about this. Look at the fact that I can't speak already. What if while I can't speak, he, he blinds me while I'm trying to cross the road? He can definitely break my legs. But look at the disciples. They were able to leave their livelihood in order to chase after this man. Now those who obeyed were filled with the Holy Spirit. But the one who disobeyed died. We're all disciples here with different intentions. God has called us to different things. God has called us with different instructions. Trust me, you don't want him dragging you, kicking and screaming. Obey the first time he speaks. Amen. Amen. Now a servant is not one who serves for praises. He merely carries out the task he is required to. If praises come, direct them upwards. Because you know what the issue is with praises. They cause pride. Now pride doesn't announce when it's coming. It doesn't inform you. You don't even see it. But it's there. Have you ever seen a person who's always commended for things they do? When they receive criticism, they get offended because they know that everything that they do is good. And when it's not good, you're the one who's wrong because because it's impossible for them to fail. Because they're always perfect. Now servants serve alone. Not in a group. It's hard to maintain a heart of a servant when you're doing it with other people. That's when murmuring starts. Now a group 
I'm not talking about people who are doing the same thing. But I'm talking about the people that you run to every time you're offended by your leader. Or people who always have an opinion about your service. Have you ever had people come and tell you you're overworked? You're abused. You're not getting enough recognition for what you do. Now, even though you didn't have these things in the beginning, but once it's spoken, you start seeing it. You start getting offended. And like, why am I always doing this? Why don't they ever recognize me? And you start serving with bitterness. Now once there's bitterness, it doesn't count. Now to all the spectators who are not serving, you stop being a busy body because you are polluting those who are willing to serve in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you see something Tell it to God. He's willing to listen. Because if you tell it to me, I'm now going to be offended by my leader. And I won't want, want to do my job. If I don't do my job, the whole body suffers. Imagine if your, your, your tongue said, not today. I'm overworked. When she needs to speak, it's me. When she needs to chew, it's me. When she needs to moisturize her lips, it's me. Not today. Imagine what would happen. So why do we decide to quit? Imagine the hand saying, I've got to scratch this person. I've got to wash them. I've got to brush them. I've got to hold things for them. Not today. So why do we do it? If you don't do your part, who's supposed to do it? Amen. Amen. Now, servants serve not because the leader is perfect. But because they're ultimately serving God. Let me tell you something. Leaders were actually born and raised here on earth just like you. They were not brought directly from heaven. Even the angels that were brought directly from heaven, they sinned. In fact, they, even, they, they, they grow, they learn leadership as well. Just like you're learning to be who you are. Your advantage is that nobody sees when your flaws are exposed. But now because they're in public, Everybody sees. Moses did not hello God. Joshua did not inquire of God when the Gibeonites showed up. David took somebody's wife. Not only that, he went and numbered Israel. And got thousands of people killed. But he was still king. Because he was chosen by God. Now you need to look beyond a man and look at the fact that you are serving God. Because if you're going to look at the man, you're going to be thinking, well, you're going to think to yourself, what are, we, what are we doing here? What are we, doing here? we are playing, what does the word do? 
Because that's what we say. And we, 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 we fail to do our part. Look at David. His leader got to a point of hating him and wanting to kill him. But he was still willing to serve. You have to refuse with yourself. And say, I'm not going to hell. So long as God said I must be here, I'm going to do what he said I must do. Until God says no more, I'm going to continue serving. Amen. Amen. There is no task too low for a servant. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. It was so low that Peter was like, no, 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 Lord, don't do it, don't do it. So whatever position you're in, it's not too high. And there's no task too low. If you gotta go wash the dishes or clean the toilet, then the dishes and the toilet are waiting for you. Amen. Amen. Go lead while doing that. Servants do not complain or count the times they've had to work. Are we all familiar with this thing at church that is called the duty roster? That just shows up in your emails. And when it shows up, you know it's because you're in it. Now there'll be people who will say, yes, about prophets you're called to do it. It's your job. Even if we remove everybody and put just you, you still got to do it. Now, there was a time way back uh, in, when uh, we had Bible study back at Sida, where I would show up at the gate and every person who'd be leading intercession would give me some excuse and ask me to please lead intercession for them. Now I'd always want to refuse because I'm thinking they're taking advantage of me. But Holy Spirit would say, do it. And I said, but I don't have any prayer points. I wasn't even prepared for this. But it say, do it. And I would get there and just trust him. And that was a, a, a lesson for me to learn to hear his voice even under pressure because I'd be pacing here in front praying and he'd be giving me the next prayer point. And as soon as I, pray, I say that prayer point, I'd have to wait on him again. And that was my growth. That other person was sacrificing their growth but I I was gaining something. So when you feel people are taking advantage of you, go back to God. If he says do it, do it. You know that when I grew from that, I'd be at a conference following the apostle, walking around minding my own business because I'm not the one leading intercession at the, at the conference. And the person who's supposed to lead the intercession is running late. And everybody's just loitering around. And the apostle would turn to me and say, Hey, Za. <laughs> She'd say, hey, Za. There's nobody leading intercession. They're still coming. So while they're on the way, just do two or three prayer points. And it would end up being me leading the whole intercession. But I wouldn't panic because I'd kill the lion and the bear in the wilderness. So now Goliath is not scary because God has trained me. 
So whatever you're given to do, do it with all your heart. Don't even complain. Because you're going to gain something. Amen. Amen. Servants speak less and do more. Because there are people who always want to have an opinion. Why isn't it done like this? I think we should do it like this. You're a servant. And you need to do as you're told. Now the issue is with servanthood. God usually doesn't take the people that, that don't know anything. He takes the people that know a lot. And he makes them to be led by people who don't know much. Now when you're a servant who knows much, you always have an opinion. I think it should be done. Like this. If you were to listen to Holy Spirit, He'd tell you keep quiet. You know why? Because even this person is in a position. He's still learning. So even in that mistake, they're going to learn something. Maybe in future, then they'll know to come to you. And ask you. Nobody has been a leader before in the house of God. It's all you. Just like being a parent, nobody has ever been a parent to you, or you have never been a parent to those kids that you are a parent to now. It's your first time. So you learn as you go. Even with the leaders, they're still learning as they go. Even if you've led 30 years, you still have something to learn. Servants take criticism with humility. And servants never retire. There's no retiring at the end of the day or retiring at 60 or 65. Moses actually got into business at 80. So when you're in service to God, it's 24-7. Have you ever had God wake you up at 1 o'clock and tell you to pray for a person and you think, couldn't it wait? Because my day starts at 6. But when you're serving God, any time is a good time. There was a time when I used to set an alarm for 3 o'clock. I would be praying. And God would wake me up at 10 to 3. And I'd say, not now, Lord. My alarm hasn't gone off. Now, in that 10 minutes, not even in the 10 minutes, a minute after refusing Holy Spirit, some demon would rock up in my room and torture me to my feet. And I learned that any time is a good time. When Holy Spirit says it's time to serve, then it's time to serve. Servants serve at the pleasure of the king. Meaning you are serving to please God. Not anybody else. So long as God is pleased. That's all that matters. Amen. Amen. Now the, the last week when we were doing revision. We spoke about the ability to recognize God at work. The best person we can use for this example is Joseph. Now Joseph had a whole lot of things happen to him that if they happen to us now, we'd need a therapist because his brothers hated him to the point of wanting to kill him. And they sold him. 
Now, they did this also because uh, he saw certain things happening in a dream. And he told his brothers. And their jealousy made them homicidal. Now, it's not everybody around you that is in support of what God wants you to be. It's not everybody that supports who you are. Some will smile at your face, but as soon as you turn, they want to do away with you. Now Joseph was sold into a foreign country with foreign gods, but he remained true to his God. Despite the temptations he faced, he, came, uh, he became faithful even to the point of imprisonment. Have you ever been so faithful to God and you thought, no, everything's going to go good? And you thought everything was going to run smooth. Because you were told that you are an international speaker. And you thought governments were going to invite you. Because they need somebody to speak to the people. No, if you're an international speaker, it means you're going to have to go to places where governments don't want Christianity. It means you'll be hunted down. It means you organize crusades and they want to shut them down. Nobody will readily say, come over. If you're called to being a pastor or a prophet, it doesn't mean the demons are going to suddenly say, oh, oh, well. There goes that. But they're going to want to tear you down. Down. But Joseph did not compromise. Uh, when he saw the troubles, he did not uh, be discouraged. Most people be become bitter thinking that God has forsaken them. But Joseph continued to be used by the Lord and be a blessing even in prison. This means you have to bloom where you planted. Even if it's a place where you don't want to be, make a difference. Now when Joseph uh, uh, when he had uh, interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker, and the butler had some good things coming his way, Joseph said, remember me when you get back there. Now, the problem is with relying on people. They forget you. Have you ever expected people to come call you? It is now all good and well. And they forget that you even exist. The butler forgot Joseph for two whole years. But he wasn't reliant on the butler. He was reliant on God. Another man who was reliant on other people was the man at the pool of Bethesda. To the point that when Jesus showed up with the healing and he asks him what he needs, the man tells him, Oh no, the people. I got nobody to put me in the pool. His reliance was not on the Lord, but it was on men. If you're reliant on people, you've got your 38 years coming for you. Now, Joseph, Joseph, now we're going to rush because of time. Now, Joseph, Joseph, uh, was brought out of prison and eventually was made prime minister. This is an impossible situation. This is a very impossible situation. How do you take a convict and make them lead a whole country? It can only be the hand of God. When Zephnet Pene was ruling, it was because 
He did not fail to fear God. If he had failed to fear God in this whole painful journey, it would have been detrimental for the whole earth. Because the Bible tells us that a famine hit all the lands. But because Joseph was faithful to God, he was able to be the solution to the whole world. Are you faithful in your prison? Are you serving other people? Or are you waiting on other people to serve you? Now Joseph, Joseph, now his brothers showed up, and when his brothers showed up, they didn't recognize him. When, and he recognized them. He could have used that opportunity to say, Nah, guys, I didn't told you a long time ago. I told you about my dreams. Look at you now. Look at me. Where am I? Aren't you bowing to me? But he was able to recognize the working of God. He could have been stuck in unforgiveness. You wanted to kill me, my enemy. But look at God. But he was able to be merciful and able to say what the enemy meant for evil. God has turned around for good. Would you have the same mindset? Or would you want to show them that you are right, that you have the power? Now, as a consecrated disciple, in a healthy growth cycle, if you are in a state of maturity, it means you are actively seeking the kingdom of God. It means you are walking in servanthood. And it means you are able to recognize the working of God. So this means from now onwards we will not have offended Christians because we are able to recognize if, that even if they are taking advantage of me I'm still gaining a skill. So at the end I'm going to be better off. Amen. Amen. I'd like to now hand over.